So today's lecture is about subsistence and economics. Um, so we're going to talk about various ways that people um, do work, um, assign value to different kinds of items, um, and all the things that we might put under the banner of economics. Now it's important to note here that um, the way that anthropologists study economics is different than the way that, for example, economists do. Um, and I think you'll see that in the lecture and, and probably saw that already in the reading. So. It's the same subjects, but just from a somewhat different angle. Um, anthropologists, as we do with everything, are interested in thinking about these things um, in a sort of cultural framework. All right, so we're going to start with subsistence, um, by which we mean essentially how people get food on the table. Okay, We know that um, people everywhere need to eat. Um, and that there are a variety of techniques that people in different uh, parts of the world and living in different kinds of circumstances employ um, to get food. So I want to run through the major ways that people produce food. Okay, This was covered in, um, in the chapter in the Perspectives book, so I just want to sort of um, add a little bit more detail and um, clarify some of those um, things that you've already read about. So these are the, the sort of major food producing techniques that I'm going to talk about. We're going to start with foraging, um, which in the past was called um, often hunting and gathering. Um, foraging is the sort of the more contemporary way of describing that. And basically what we mean when we talk about foraging um, is that people who are using this kind of technique um, to collect food are um, making use of wild plant and animal food sources in the environment where they live. Okay, so in other words, um, foragers don't plant crops. Um, they just collect um, plants that um, uh, emerge naturally in their environment. Okay, so one of the things that it means is that the particular kind of knowledge, the expertise of the forager, um, is very much about knowing, uh, for example, when particular plants um, produce edibles, right? Um, and in terms of animals, um, when and where animals migrate, right, and how to capture them. So it's really um, being very good at exploiting the natural resources um, in that area. That is what the forager excels at. Um, these images are from southern Africa, the Kung people who are uh, people who make use of foraging and often um, their way of life is, is used as an example of foraging. Um, if you look on the right, you see one of the food staples for the Kong, which is mongongo nuts. Um, nuts are especially valuable for foragers because um, A, they are, during certain times of the year, produced in great quantities, as you can see here, and also because they're incredibly rich food sources. Um, so they have um, lots of calories uh, and they're um, sort of rich in all the kinds of nutrients one might need. So. Um, so Kung people collect various kinds of food, but the nuts are um, a very important source of um, their for their diet. One thing that's often misunderstood about foraging is the relationship between the hunting part and the gathering part. Um, in fact, what we see uh, most of the time is that gathering is by far where most of the food that foragers eat come from. Right? It's the plant stuff, um, not the animal stuff that um, that that makes up most of the diet. So meat is certainly part of it, uh, but it's um, less frequently consumed and it's a smaller percentage of the diet than the plant materials that are collected. So these are foragers. Now, <clears throat> uh, I'm gonna talk about these next two uh, food production techniques side by side because they're similar in certain ways and it's easier to understand them by comparing them and that's horticulture and agriculture. Both of these techniques are about cultivating uh, plant food sources. Okay? So people who are um, engaging in horticulture as well as those engaging in agriculture are doing things in the environment to make plants grow that they can then eat. Right? That's the, sort of the, the most simple way to think about it. But they're doing so in somewhat different ways. One way to think about the relationship between horticulture and agriculture is on a continuum. Horticulture is at one end and agriculture is at the other. 
So at the horticulture end of this continuum, uh, we have people cultivating plant foods, but with a, a, a lower number or degree of inputs. That is, they're doing less to transform the environment than the agriculturalist. They're still transforming it, um, but in a way that is a little bit more um, in sync with the natural processes going on in that environment that would be happening whether they were there or not. Whereas agriculturalists really sort of take control um, as, as t to a greater extent of, um, of how that environment is operating to produce that food. Let me explain what I mean. <clears throat> so on the left, you see two examples of of people engaged in horticulture. Um, in, on the top slide, it's top left in Venezuela and the bottom left in Papua New Guinea. Horticulturalists use um, fairly simple tools, right? Um, so for example, the bottom left slide, you see a man using um, a digging stick, right? Um, so it's just what it sounds like. Um, it's a stick used to um, plant crops, right? Plant seeds or, or tubers or whatever you might be um, putting in the ground. Um, so it's done manually, um, you know, by hand, sort of one by one, right? Um, the top left is uh, depicting the technique of what is often called slash and burn or swidden um, horticulture, wherein um, at the end of a growing season, the horticulturalists burn off the leftover um, vegetation on, on the land. And that burning process and the ash that it creates acts to fertilize that piece of land for future planting. Slash and burn depends on a system of rotating your crops across a slightly bigger territory. Your book talks about this. Um, so what that means is horticulturalists plant an area. Um, once they have harvested the food from that, they burn off the leftover vegetation, and then they let it sit. They let it lie fallow. That's the, the term for it, meaning they're not going to plant it the next year. They're going to let it sit there for a few years, a few cycles, in order to regenerate the nutrients um, in that piece of ground, right? So in the meantime, they're going to have to go plant somewhere else. So in other words, horticulture works best when people have access to quite a bit of land, right? Where there um, is a fairly low population density, such that you can plant in plot A on one year and then move over to plot B for another year and then over to plot C. And eventually you'll come back to the beginning, but that you're going to uh, have the space to let your previous plot lie fallow, okay? Until it's ready to, it's regenerated enough that it can be planted again, okay? Um, another thing to note about uh, horticulturalists is in keeping with this idea of fairly low inputs and um, making use of sort of natural processes in the environment, horticulturalists also depend on rainfall for their irrigation, okay? So they're not um, adding a, a system where they're sort of, you know, piping or, or somehow getting water into the field. They're relying on natural rainfall, okay? Um, and again, like the foragers I talked about in the last slide, horticulturalists are expert in understanding the environment they're working in, right? So they're able to do this. But it also means, of course, that there are um, some um, susceptibilities to things like, say, drought, right? Um, if you're dependent on rainfall for irrigating your food source, and there's the odd year where it doesn't rain enough, that can have really serious um effects on people, of course. So agriculture on the right side, then, in comparison, again, similar in a lot of ways, people cultivating plant food sources, but um, agriculture is at the other end of that continuum. So agriculturalists um, add a lot more inputs to the land to make it produce than the horticulturalists do. So what is the nature of those inputs? Well, the first and one of the most significant ones um, is adding um, something beyond just manual human labor. So, for example, the use of plow animals, right? You see the man on the top right um, plowing the field. This is an uh, image from India. Um, when you have um, two oxen and a plow, 
you can do a lot more. You can cover a lot more ground. You can dig deeper, right? You can um, sort of, you can make a bigger transformation of the landscape with that kind of technology than you can, for example, with the digging stick depicted on the left side, right? So, um, so the idea with agriculture is that it's, um, again, more transformation, more inputs, and then to some extent, more outputs as well, right? A greater yield. Agriculturalists, unlike horticulturalists, then also take control of the irrigation of their crops. So you see on the bottom right, um, an irrigation system in the Philippines. Um, and these take various forms, but the point is that um, the agriculturalists don't simply rely on natural rainfall, um, that they um, they capture water and direct water to increase the likelihood that their crops will get the amount of moisture that they need. Okay, so agriculturalists are a more intensive version of what horticulturalists do, and because they're adding all these inputs, things like using plow animals, irrigation, agriculturalists will also add fertilizer, for example, to fields they are able to work and rework the same plot of ground more continuously than the horticulturalist, right? I talked about slash and burn or Sweden agriculture in the, or, or Sweden um, planting in the case of horticulturalists where they have to rotate through different plots, right? Give them time to come back. Um, agriculturalists are going to tend to rework the same plot and to keep that, um, that, fertility of the land up by doing things like adding fertilizer. So you will find that agriculture is possible even in much more densely populated places or places where there's a just a bigger population of people living closer together, right? Um, so where and therefore people don't have a ton of land where they can rotate their crops through. They may only have one relatively modest plot that they need to work all the time. So to get that, to make that possible, you need to add more things, put more labor into the land to make it yield the same amount of food. The next food production technique we're going to talk about is pastoralism. So um, whereas uh, horticulture and agriculture are about plants, right? Um, pastoralism is about animals. Um, and the folks whose main way of, of getting food is through pastoralism um, make use of all of the different kinds of edibles that, um, that animals can uh, provide, okay? So indeed, what you'll find with pastoralists is um, their main food sources, their staple foods, are not actually usually meat. We would think, if we think about pastoralists, right, someone like the Maasai um, man on the left with a herd of cows, um, or in, on the bottom um, in Sudan, um, camels, we'd think like, oh, they must be eating a lot of meat, right? Um, but actually, if you think about it, eating meat as a pastoralist would very quickly deplete your primary source of food, because to get meat from an animal, you need to kill the animal. Um, and what you really need to do as a pastoralist is to maintain your herd. So you certainly can't eat meat at a rate that's faster than the animals can reproduce, right? So instead, what we find that pastoralists mainly eat is all the other kinds of things that you can get from animals without having to kill them. So, of course, milk and all the kinds of things you can make from milk, whether cheese or yogurt, etc., butter. Um, in some cases, in fact, even um, drawing blood from the animal um, and consuming blood is part of that diet. Um, so pastoralists, um, again, their primary focus is on herd animals and the um, foodstuffs that they can, can derive from those animals. Now, I will also say that pastoralists um, usually do not only eat that. They usually also eat um, plant foods but often will gain those plant foods by um, trading or buying and selling them um, from neighboring uh, horticulturalists or agriculturalists in exchange for animal food stuff. So they, they um, typically do not plant crops. Pastoralists, the work that they do is 
um, is solely in managing and growing and making use of their herds. And finally, I wanted to talk about industrialized food production, which is really a very different kind of category than the others, but it seems important to include it here, um, especially because um, uh, the majority of us, uh, I'll guess that most, if not all of you, get our own foods through this, through industrialized food production. One of the most notable things about industrialized food production is that there is a different relationship between the production of the food and the consumption of the food than we find in all the previous things I've been talking about, right? So for foragers, horticulturalists, agriculturalists, pastoralists, they're all engaged in uh, kinds of subsistence practices wherein the same people who produce the food stuff also eat it, right? Um, so the pastoralists are, you know, getting milk from their animals and they are drinking it themselves. The horticulturalists are producing yams or whatever it may be and they're eating them themselves. Um, in industrialized food production there's a much longer path and the producer and the consumer are often not in direct touch and in fact don't even really know who the other one is. Okay, This is what your book refers to as commodity chains where there's actually a long route through various hands from beginning to end of the chain. So if you see this image on the left of a sort of typical American supermarket, right, which I'm sure many of us visit these all the time, um, or something similar to it, um, many of us, um, when we go into a supermarket, we look at those you know, tomatoes or apples, all those um, different kinds of produce on the stand there, we don't know for sure where they even came from. Um, sometimes there might be a label that says what country they were produced in, but the route that that tomato took to get from wherever it came out of the ground to that shelf um, is probably quite a long one. Um, so um, industrialized food production is food production at a, at a massive scale, right? Um, you see this sort of mechanized, high-tech farming in these other images, whether it's um, producing grain or producing meat, right? So it's at a much bigger scale. Um, it involves um, high technology and high inputs to increase the yield. Um, and it is wrapped up in a system of capitalist distribution and consumption. That means that the consumer is at a different point in the network than the producer. And that, in fact, um, as I mentioned, rarely do our paths cross. Most of us will never visit one of the farms where the food that we eat was produced, right? And that is a very different kind of relationship to food and the economics of food than um, those experienced by the forager or the pastoralist or the agriculturalist. Okay, so, um, in this unit, there's sort of two parts. The first part that we were just talking about is how people get food on the table, okay? Now I wanna sort of segue into um, another sort of related part, which is more about um, not just food, not just subsistence, but also um, all the different ways that, um, that economic practices are enacted in different cultural contexts. Um, and when I talk about economic practices, I mean both um, work and all the different forms that work takes, um, but also buying and selling stuff, trading, all the kinds of exchange that take place, okay? So we're going to talk about both of those things, both work in, you know, sort of broader, more conceptual terms, um, and then also exchange, and how both of those things ultimately connect to um, ideas about identity and status, right? Um, because the fact is all of these processes um, go directly to sort of who we are in a society. So um, let's start with, with what your book refers to, refers to as modes of production. And when we talk, what, we're, what we mean when we're talking about modes of production is really just how work is organized in different settings, okay? Um, so, you know, it, People everywhere work, right? Um, that is really the sort of the centerpiece of life. You have to work in some regard, 
So what the anthropologist who coined this term, modes of production, was trying to get at is to try to think about what are the categories, the different ways that people organize their work lives. Um, and the suggestion is that there are, are three basic kinds of work, okay, or work settings, um, domestic, tributary, and capitalist. Um, all of us, right, all of you and myself included, um, um, are certainly embedded in a capitalist mode of production. It's entirely possible that some of you also are a, a part of domestic work units, right? So you don't necessarily need to pick one or the other. Um, there are places where those different kinds of, of sort of work organization are overlapping, right? Um, so it's not, you know, each society gets only one, but there are different sort of um, ways that work um, is done. So we can talk about all of them. So in a domestic mode of production, we're really just talking about um, uh, a family group pulling together um, and that the work is essentially a family-owned enterprise or business or something else. So in the top um, slide there, for example, you see a couple in India um, working on a family farm, right? Um, so there are plenty of settings including right here in Chicago, right, where like an entire family will all be working at a shared sort of communal family venture, right? Um, again, something like a farm might be a more independent domestic venture than something like a shop, which can be both domestic, organized around domestic labor and also embedded in a capitalist system, right? So again, they're not mutually exclusive, but a uh, domestic mode of production is one in which uh, the family works together, right? And in that setting then, also one of the things you'd find is it's less likely that the members of the family, for example, get a wage, right? Instead, the idea is there's sort of collective labor that goes towards the collective value, right, or profit that that venture might, um, might bring about. A tributary mode of production is one in which essentially there's... Um, two classes, a sort of ruling class, and then everybody else. And everybody else um, has to yield some of the proceeds from their typically domestic work to that ruling class. Um, so tributary modes of production, um, we, we primarily think about those or, or, or see examples of those in the historical past. It's something like... Um, in a kingdom, right, where there's a sort of a monarch, a monarch or one sort of separate ruling class um, that the non-ruling class has to, for example, um, contribute some part of what they produce in the fields or some kind of um, tax to the ruling class to support it, right? Um, so it, it's um, less commonly a part of sort of the contemporary global economy, but it's one of those modes of production to point out. And the third mode of production that your book talks about is capitalist. Um, and what we're talking about here is really the, the dominant form that um, around which the world has been organized since the Industrial Revolution, which took place from around 1760 to 1840. When we talk about the Industrial Revolution, we're talking about the transition from um, more agrarian lifestyles, right? So from people working on farms and working more in a sort of subsistence mode where you produce for your own family to consume and moving instead to more mechanized um, workspaces, right? Such as, for example, factories, as you see on the bottom slide here, right? Where um, the relationship between people and their work and the proceeds of their work were radically transformed. So instead of working in your own field to produce your own food, now people started working in a factory, right, for somebody else and taking home money in the form of wages. So they didn't take home the stuff they made in the factory, right, and they didn't own the factory. They were now laborers, workers, right, who were selling their labor for cash wages. Um, and I know that's something that we take for granted now, but that's a relatively recent thing, right? And um, we look to the Industrial Revolution um, in, the, in the 18th, 19th century um, as the sort of turning point 
in global history where um, people's relationship to their work shifted. Um, and it has remained in that way for many of us ever since, right? There are still, of course, uh, farmers and people who live in agrarian settings and don't work in, again, sort of other sites where they work for money instead of for the products of their own labor. Um, but this transformed um, the global economy in, in really significant ways, right? Um, a final point to make about about work and the relationship between work and the economy is the distinction between formal and informal economic activities. So even as we're talking about sort of the difference between a domestic um, mode of production and a capitalist mode of production, there's also um, this distinction between or sort of, you know, sort of somewhere in between um, something like informal activities, right? So the formal economy is the part of economic activity that is captured in official statistics and goes to things like um, computing the, the GDP of different countries. The informal economy is um, still embedded in capitalism, but is one where people are engaging in economic activities outside of the formal channels. Um, so things like people selling stuff out of their house, right, or selling stuff on the street. Um, all of these things um, are part of that informal economy, which, again, often is not recorded. People aren't getting wages or um, W-2s or paying taxes on any of those things. So these things are often not um, captured um, in formal economic statistics, but they are actually a huge percentage of the economic activity worldwide. Now, another important part of the subject of exchange, or sorry, the subject of um, economic activity is exchange, right? So we're just talking about how people work, and the different ways that work is organized. Another um, key thing that anthropologists interested in the economy look at is exchange. Um, so that is the different ways that, um, that materials of value move between people. Okay. Um, and again, there's sort of some categories or some, some key concepts that emerge out of the anthropological literature on this question of exchange. Um, so one kind of exchange is what anthropologists refer to as reciprocity. This is a good anthropology term. Um, and the, the simplest way to talk about it is it's what we're really talking about here is gifts and giving gifts. Okay. Um, so, in other words, something that has the sense of a back and forth, but it's not um, buying something in a store. You're exchanging something with other people, right? And there's sort of rules to how you do it, but it's, it's not uh, one of the impersonal transactions you have if you go to a corner store and buy a pack of gum, right? You give the person whatever, a dollar seventy nine, and they give you a pack of gum. That, that's market exchange, which we'll talk about in a minute. There's other kinds of ways that you exchange things with people, um, and a, a chunk of them fall under this category of reciprocity, again, which I'm going to gloss as gifts for now. Now, as your book points out, there's different sorts of reciprocity. So we can break reciprocity down into generalized reciprocity, balanced reciprocity, and negative reciprocity. Okay, And I'm sorry, I know there's sort of a lot of terms here. Um, but you've got all the terms also in your book, and the concepts are actually pretty interesting. So hopefully that'll help you to, to remember which is which, okay? So when we talk about generalized reciprocity, what we're talking about is exchanges that happen among people who are socially close to one another. Often when we talk about generalized reciprocity, where we find that happening is in a family. And the idea is that people exchange all kinds of stuff and favors and labor and whatever else, and they do so quite freely without really keeping track of who's done what for whom, okay? So, for example, if you um, want to use the, the top uh, picture here as a reference, 
um, within a family unit, for example, um, child care by older siblings for younger siblings might be part of the sort of daily activity of a member of that group, right? Or um, members of the family all working together on the family farm, right? Um, so the idea here is that everyone is, in a general way, gifting their labor, their, their stuff, whatever, to the group with the understanding that the well-being of that group is collective. So it helps you to help the group, right? So again, that tends to happen really only in a context where that group is tied together very tightly as a social unit, right? Um, often in situations of being actually related to those other people as, as members of your family, okay? So you're seeing here that there's also a, a social element to this idea of exchange, right? It's not just about the stuff. It's also about how the stuff relates to how you are in relationship with other people. So if that's generalized reciprocity, then we can also talk about balanced reciprocity. Um, and my image for that is, um, I don't know if any of you guys watch The Office, uh, the, uh, the show The Office, but um, as you may recall, there's... Uh, uh, a couple of episodes in there about um, gift giving and in particular secret Santa gift giving. This is a great example of what balanced reciprocity is. So again, remember it's an exchange among people and it's directly connected to the relationships among those people. Well, in the case of balanced reciprocity, um, unlike generalized reciprocity where people are not really keeping track, it's just sort of like, let's all help each other within the group. With balanced reciprocity, there's this idea that you're exchanging something with someone and there's an expectation that you will exchange things of roughly equal value, okay? Uh, balanced reciprocity still tends to take place among people who have a social relationship, but it's not quite as close as the family relationships where you'd find generalized reciprocity. With balanced reciprocity, you expect that you will give something and that you will get something of similar value back. So um, the Secret Santa thing is a good example, right? Where there's the expectation that um, you will give something and you will get something that's about the same. If somebody gives an extraordinarily generous gift or if somebody gives something really cheap, either way will seem like a problem, right? It will disrupt things because it will unbalance the exchange. Um, think about it too if you exchange in gift giving with friends or other people in your social network, right? Um, if you give a friend, um, you know, a, a gold necklace and they give you back um, a candy bar, right? It would feel like something went wrong there. Either um, you value your relationship differently or you misread something about how close you are to that person or that other person's status or something else, right? So the idea, and, and it, one of the interesting parts about this is that it's not that these rules are written down anywhere or that you have an open conversation. It's more like you just know what kind of a gift would be appropriate or would be inappropriate. And you, um, you, you, somehow know, right, somehow meaning because you're trained culturally to do it, um, um, how to balance out those exchanges in, in, a, in an appropriate way. Uh, negative reciprocity, as your book mentioned, is basically um, where it, one member of the exchange tries to get something for nothing, right? Um, so where there isn't a the other side of the exchange, where there isn't really that reciprocal um, uh, sort of return. Um, so some of the examples they gave are, for example, email scams or something like gambling, right? Um, where by definition, the per one member of the exchange is trying to get something out of the other member without having to give, give anything back in return, right? There are two other kinds of um, exchange that your book mentions. One is redistribution. Okay, redistribution is where um, the exchange is basically into the center of an institution and back out. Taxes are a good example, right? Um, everybody in the society pays taxes into a central institution, the government, and then the government uses that money to redistribute it 
out to in programs and services and other things for members of that society, right? Um, so that is redistribution. So it's shifting the, the resources from sort of some people to other people via a centralized institution. Um, and finally, market exchange, which I alluded to in the beginning, is, you know, probably something we, again, all um, participate in every day. Um, it's any of the kinds of um, transactions, impersonal transactions we have when we go into a store, right? So this is based on um, market rates of exchange, right? Um, what the market has deemed the value of a pack of gum to be, um, and that is the amount of currency that you hand over in exchange for your gum. Okay, um, sort of the final um, set of issues I want to address for this lecture um, has to do with um, how buying things, consuming things, um, is also very much connected to questions of status and identity, right? Um, as your book notes, um, when we when we consume things, right, meaning when we when we buy stuff or acquire things, um, it's often for reasons that go well beyond a practical need for something, right? Um, so, you know, you could say, well, I I need clothing, right, because I live in cold climate in Chicago, um, so I need to keep my body warm. Um, but most of the sort of clothing that we buy has other things that it's also doing um, that have to do with who we are, or how we want to be perceived, how we relate to the people around us. Um, and these are very important elements of the material objects that circulate as a part of the economy. So if we think about status and identity, we can immediately think about some of the ways that the things that we buy and that people sell us are coded for other kinds of things beyond just practical function. Um, so these, um, these logos in the bottom, these brand names, um, many of them speak to high status, right? They're, um, they signify um, wealth, right? Um, and sort of elitism. Um, likewise, something like food, right? We could say, well, you need food to eat, of course, but the sort of very fancy food that you would get at an expensive restaurant, that is not just about nourishment, right? It's also a sign of status. So in consuming these items, um, we also consume all the other cultural baggage attached to them. Um, likewise, um, you know, objects and the various other um, commodities that, that we acquire can, um, can challenge expectations about identity. This is from a fashion show in the last couple of years. And you see the designer sort of playing with um, the idea of, of gender and clothing, right? Um, so commodities are not just um, about functionality. Um, and they are often directly connected to um, cultural expectations. Um, and they can both um, sort of play out things that we already perceive about the world, or they can also inform our very perceptions of the world. Um, so when we start thinking about that, how people consume things and how it attaches to issues of status and identity, um, that can bring us to the category of class, um, which is another one of those sort of identity markers that we can talk about alongside things like um, gender and race and ethnicity and other things that we've already talked about in class. Um, it's one that tends to be a little bit more slippery, a little bit harder to get a hold of. And I think one of the reasons for that is that class is simultaneously economic and cultural. Um, I think um, we often tend to think about the economic part first, right? The class is about how much money you have. Um, and it is about that, but it's also about some of the sort of um, cultural things that connect to those questions of who has money, right? Um, so um, I think class sort of pushes both of those things. Um, so we can think then of some of the ways in which class is not only financial, but also cultural, right? 
Um, and one of the key ways is in terms of this question of um, what people consume, um, which is not only about having the money to consume it, but it's also about having a certain sort of know-how or a certain sort of insider knowledge, right? Some of the most highly valued items um, up for consumption um, are those that, again, um, on the surface, do not necessarily have value. They only have value insofar as they've been um, uh, sort of deigned to carry that value um, around questions of class and status. So items like art or fine wine, um, one of the ways that the sort of the gatekeeping around these valuable items is maintained is through class structures, right? Um, uh, again, some of the rituals around eating fine dining, right? Um, knowing which fork to use or which little glass to use. Those are cultural phenomena, but the code for class. So here, again, we see the intersection between wealth or financial standing and the sort of cultural knowledge that attaches to different points in the social hierarchies. Now, um, when we start thinking about class and hierarchies, we can also think about that much more broadly. Um, and the way that your book talks about it is in thinking about the global political economy, right? So um, questions of class, right? Like, um, you know, do you get the invitation to the fancy art exhibit, right? Um, and do you know which wine to pick? That kind of cultural differentiation, that kind of um, social hierarchy. We can think about that as being writ large across the whole world. Um, and, you know, as we've talked about in, in previous weeks, um, the fact of the matter is that we live in a world that is incredibly inequitable, right? Where um, the kinds of things that people have access to um, in different parts of the world are really, really uneven. Um, and the economy is one of the primary places where we can see that inequity. Um, so we can think about the inequities in the global political economy in various ways, right? Um, the most obvious way is just to look at the sort of the, the bare economic terms, right? How much money do people have, right? Um, so here's a map, for example, that's GDP per capita, right? Um, so how much money do people have on a yearly basis, right? And you can see that it's starkly different. And along the lines that we might expect from things we've talked about previously in the course, right? Um, we know that some parts of the world are simply much more impoverished than others. Um, and the amount that people are paid for their work in those places and the amount that they can get for the things they produce in those places are much, much lower than, for example, in the United States, right? Um, so this map should should not really be a surprise, even as it is pretty shocking. So you see that North America, or the US, Canada, Western Europe, um, have by far the highest GDP, right? Um, those numbers go down as we look at Central and South America, um, and um, Central and East Asia, and then they go down even further when we look at um, South Asia uh, and the African continent. Um, so we have the full spectrum here, right? From um, less than $1,000 to greater than $60,000. So um, this, is, this map encapsulates sort of the basic economic inequities that we see globally. Once we know there's that pattern, we can then look at the ways that those economic inequities manifest across the world. And this is something that your book refers to as structural violence, right? So um, in other words, that those economic structures that um, sort of create those inequities then cause all kinds of harm against the people, particularly in those under-resourced or poorer parts of the world. So if you remember this 
this map, right, which is about economic inequities, um, here's a map of hunger, right? Um, and clearly, these two maps correspond. Um, the folks in the parts of the world with the lowest GDP have the highest rates of chronic hunger. Likewise, we can also map that onto health, right? We talked about health recently in class. Um, one measure of health is life expectancy at birth. We're seeing the same pattern, right? So here's that structural violence again. Um, it's not just about how much money people have. It's about what being at the, um, at the wrong end of that inequity, what that means for your well-being and for your life experience. Um, so the same folks with these very low GDPs are experiencing chronic hunger, have a low life expectancy. Um, and in fact, also, this extends to something like education. Also um, have, in general, um, many fewer years of schooling, right? So it becomes this sort of totalizing system then. Um, the global political economy um, is a structure that informs all basic aspects of people's um, lives and experiences and possibilities uh, for being well and thriving. Um, so, um, you know, these are, I think, the major takeaway points from your book's discussion of global political economy. Um, and I'll just end by hearkening back to something we talked about a couple of lectures ago, which is that these patterns that we're seeing in all these maps are not an accident. And there's nothing natural about them, that these have long historical roots, okay? So if you remember when we talked about race and ethnicity a few weeks ago, we talked about sort of um, the historical antecedents to things like um, inequities and racism in the United States right now. Um, and we can go back hundreds of years to things like European colonization of the world or the slave trade that was a part of that and start to see that it was these same countries um, who had their resources depleted, their populations depleted, their um, political autonomy uh, challenged and eroded, their economies depleted um, by sort of the creation of a global economic system in those same places today, right? These maps are from the last few years, all of them, these previous maps. Even today then, right? Hundreds of years later, we see the same places that were affected by colonization, by the slave trade, etc., cetera, um, seeing much lower levels of schooling, much lower life expectancies, uh, high rates of hunger, and these very low GDPs. So this is just to say, we want to understand the state of the global economy today, and it's important not to ever assume that it somehow is just the way things are, or just the way things are supposed to be, but that instead, it's very much a product of our particular human history. And therefore, it's also something that can change. Um, and that's probably the most important thing that we could put our energies to um, as we move forward. So um, I will end there, um, and I hope you guys have a great rest of the week.